I've got another mini PC to look at, and this one is a lot more powerful than the previous ones I looked at that were based on the Intel parts, because this is the Geekom AS6. It's powered by Asus. They work together with Asus for the board and everything. And this features the AMD Ryzen 9 6900HX. And I'm really impressed that they were able to fit, you know, that into this tiny, tiny case. So let's talk about the size, 120 by 130 by 58 millimeters. And it weighs 0.9 kilograms, which is almost two pounds for everyone in the US of A. Thanks to Hookies for sponsoring. When you go and buy a regular key from Microsoft, it's not $22.54. And in fact, right now there's a mid-year mid sale, plus we have the 25% off with the coupon code TS25. So you're gonna get some money off of this as well. When you go and buy Windows 10 Pro, or home. Uh, Windows 10, I believe, still activates Windows 11. So we've got Office 2021, 2019, and 2016 here. If you get an OEM key, the way it works is you're expected to do your own tech support. That's one of the reasons why the price is lower, but we all do our own tech support anyway, right? Then that key is technically locked to your hardware. You could buy like 10 of these keys for the price of a retail key. So I'll just buy another one the next time I move somewhere else. Once you're finished, all you have to do is click on your user account up here, go to your user center, click on my purchase orders, and then you'll see everything you've purchased right there. Just view keys and codes, and you can just copy and paste your key, hit start, type activate, click on activation settings, paste it in there, click on next, and you will be activated. So that's why I use Who Keys. This is something that's not just a regular mini PC. This is probably overkill for a living room. This is something I would use for like productivity, you know, Photoshop, 3D work, even making games if you wanted to, like 2D games, especially in Unity uh, or 4K video editing, like you see here on the screen. And I'm editing that. And I was editing that at, you know, with a at reduced rate. And then I decided to try editing it at full resolution, not a stutter. It just, just works. But then again, it's the AMD Ryzen 9 6900HX. I guess I just expected something this small to not be able to handle it, but it, it does. Now you can also get this in multiple different flavors. You can get it in the Ryzen 7 6800H. And that one might be something that's better for just straight up gaming because they're both gonna have the same Radeon 680M graphics card. That's about the equivalent of a 1050 Ti. Of course, all the emulators are gonna play just fine on this hardware. Um, it's really, you know, it's beefy enough for that. You know, PS3, maybe a little bit sketchy. Yuzu, maybe a little bit sketchy. But I'm talking like all the retro consoles are going to work just fine. Now, when it comes to like modern games, indie games are mostly going to work. I tried several different indie games on this. And I'm going to start off with some of the big ones, like Age of Wonders 4. Age of Wonders is somewhat similar to like the Heroes of Might and Magic games, maybe the Civilization games. You can get different units. You have a hero unit. Uh, and there's all kinds of all the different fantasy classes to choose from classes and, and uh, species races whatever people call it nowadays i don't know like orcs and elves and halflings and undead and just all kinds of different things so you get to pick your hero and you have characters and you move them around the map and you can fight other characters that are on the map there's different factions that are building up their own empires and you also have to manage your empire build up different things build new buildings um some people are going to say it's kind of similar to the anno games maybe but I don't know, I think to me, for me, it's more similar to the Heroes of Might and Magic of the King's Bounty games. Um, and this one, the graphics are a bit over the top. Like, it's kind of ridiculous. So I ran this on high, 1080p, and it ran just fine on the main map. Once I got into the battles, it was a little bit slower. I would probably recommend turning a few things down. I turned off MSAA. Didn't notice too much of a difference in quality because I was sitting back on the couch. Still really beautiful. Um, and this game, I can't believe how good this looks, and it's running on the system. Now, speaking of things that I can't believe are running on this system, I put the new System Shock remake on here. Uh, and both of these games I just started playing. So I, you know, I wanted to test them out here. I just got them both, but I was like, brand new indie games. I want to try them right here. I guess System Shock's not really technically indie, but maybe it was kind of indie until they got bought by Atari. Anyway, System Shock is beautiful and it's running on medium 1080p. 100% playable in my opinion. I would play it on this just fine. I wouldn't go play a brand new like competitive Twitch shooter, but I would play this. It's an immersive sim. Doesn't require quite as, you know, quick uh, reflexes or whatever. So, you know, the FPS may get pretty close to that 30 here and there, but it is playable in my opinion if you keep it on medium. And I think it looks really good on medium. Above and beyond that, pretty much all the 2D indie games that have been coming out in the last few years are going to play just fine. All the stuff that's being made in Unity and Godot is going to play really, really well. Um, the 3D stuff is going to be hit or miss, depending on what you want to do and what settings you want to turn up. Most things are going to play fine on medium, even some of the more graphically intense games. 720 if you have to, but 1080p medium for most things is going to work just fine. So this can be a capable gaming machine. So let's talk about what else is under the hood here. Now here's a shot of the screen, just showing you what I've got in this version. We've got 32 gigabytes of RAM, 
and that's DDR5 memory in this unit. So we do have an M.2 in there, and that's Gen 4x4. We've got one terabyte. You can get two terabyte if you want to configure it that way. You've got Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.0. And you can support four different screens, all kinds of things. 2.5 gigabit LAN as well. I love that because a lot of my boards right now also have the 2.5 gigabit and I have that on my router. So it's super fast when it comes to that. Now in the near future, I'm also gonna be taking a look at some of the brand new Ryzen parts, the seven series or whatever. And I do wanna say that the 6900 HX is not quite as fast, like the Ryzen 9 in this generation is not quite as fast as the fastest Ryzen 7 in the next generation, but the price is really good here. So that's like the main thing. You get a very, very good sort of sweet spot here with the 6900HX. You got plenty of cores, you know, eight cores, 16 threads, so you can do some rendering. I leave this thing on rendering all night long. Uh, it boosts up to 4.7 gigahertz and only draws 35 watts of power. How about a tour? There's your audio mic port, plus the, you know, also speakers out. That is USB four right there on the front. Now this will also act as display port and it'll give you an 8K resolution output right there. Beside that we have USB 3.2 and then just the power button there on the side. Moving over we got grills. There we go, grills on both sides. There we go, the bottom rubber feet. All right, let's go through the ports on the back. Two HDMI, they both support 4K at 60 hertz. And this will support 5K, which is 5120 by 2160 at 60 hertz. Then we have another USB 4 or display port right there. And that will support 8K at 60 hertz as well. USB 3.2 on the back as well. And then this is 2.5 gigabit ethernet, Wi-Fi 6 on the inside. That's just your power port right there. On top of all that, we also have Thunderbolt. So that USB-C on the back, that's Thunderbolt. And that can support 8K at 60 hertz. So we have a lot of different options there. You get data transmission speeds of 40 gigabits per second. And then as far as power delivery goes, five volts at three amps. So that can keep a lot of things charged. Small external monitor or something, you should be able to power that just fine without having to plug it into the wall. Just plug it up to the USB-C on the front or the back. So it really is like a lot of stuff in a small package. It's really easy to get access to the internal components. You simply just remove four screws that are just where the rubberized feet are. You just remove the four screws that are where the rubber feet are. And then you can lift up the bottom panel and then you can open it up. And you notice we have PCB going on on both sides. That's how they fit everything into this small case. You can expand the M.2. There's an extra slot there and that's Gen 4 by 4 NVMe. And then you can also see you have access to the SO DIMMs. Those are DDR5 DIMMs. This one came with some crucial memory, but you can swap that out on your own if you wanted to. So you can see under the hood, we have plenty of room for so you can see under the hood, we have plenty of room for user upgrades. They claim military grade durability. I didn't throw this down no stairs or take it to the top of no mountains, but uh, extreme temperatures, altitude and humidity. So I guess if you wanted to take this on your extreme journey and have something that you can edit all your videos with, it'll do it. Not sure, I, let me know what you're gonna use this for. Maybe using this at a base in Antarctica, I'd get, get 900 of these for the 30 people that are there. So I did a benchmark here while I was fooling around. You can see that result on the screen, 1080p. Uh, but we've got some more benchmarks we can take a look at, like Cinebench. How does this CPU stack up? Look at that, faster than the uh, mobile i9s. I mean, it's a beast of a CPU, especially in this small size. It's an absolute beast. And look how much faster this is than the i7-7700K. Remember when that was like the thing and, and it was ridiculous? So any games you want to play from that era are going to be well, even the, you know, the next few generations are going to be really good on this. It's faster than some of the Xeons, but yeah, it's, it's got a, it's got a really nice speed for the size that it is. And then we also did some Geekbench, I'll put those scores on the screen here so you can see what Geekbench looks like with OpenCL and also with the regular performance. We'll just scroll those down here. And just in my use, I never felt like it was chugging or anything like that. It was always snappy. And that's like, I know a silly statistic, but it, it tells you something. It tells you that while I'm using it, it was responsive. It didn't stutter, it didn't do anything weird. It was better than I expected for the size. So what are my gripes with this unit? It does get loud when you're really taxing the CPU. Didn't really get loud when I was playing video games. So that's a bonus. And it didn't get loud when I was watching media using Jellyfin. I couldn't hear it at all actually. So if you wanna watch movies with this, that's great. Even editing videos, it would, you know, you'd hear the fan ramp up a little bit here and there, but only when I was doing like some hardcore rendering with like AV1 for long periods of time, 
After like a few minutes, the fan would get higher and higher until you could hear kind of a low whir in the background all the time. I'm running this bench park now. I've been running it for a while and um, I don't really hear the unit. Whenever it's, you know, doing GPU and CPU stuff, I don't really hear it. So I'm going to turn on the decibel meter and get a room tone and then we'll put it a few inches away and just see if I can hear any different. Okay, the room is very loud. 75, 76 decibels. This is a loud room. I guess there's like lots of room tone. All right, when I put it about three inches away from the unit, it went from 75 to 80. I mean, it's kind of getting lost in the way. I don't really hear it very much in here. I'd have to like really concentrate. So it's not that loud, not as loud as I remember it being. Okay, my second gripe, and this is very specific to me. Maybe this doesn't matter to you, but the only uh, you know actual audio port is in the front. And I like to use regular audio speakers. I don't like to go through the HDMI or any of that stuff or use USB speakers. So if I'm gonna set this on my desk, I'm always gonna to have to have a cable snaked around to the front. And it just, it's whatever, I mean, it's there. I wish the front could be like clean and I didn't have to have a cable wrapping around and all that nonsense. But that's, that's a thing. I've been noticing that with a lot of the mini PCs, you just have one audio port and it's on the front designed for headphones or just plugging right in on your desk. I really like seeing audio ports on the front and the back, but I realize also a lot of people are gonna use this with just straight up HDMI. Now, the downside of using HDMI for a small device like this, let's say you plugged it up in your living room and you've got some speakers in there and you wanna use this to listen to some music. Well, as soon as your monitor goes off, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whenever you have your, your sleep set for your monitor, if the monitor goes off, it stops getting the HDMI signal that goes out to your speakers and the sound will cut off. So if you want the monitor to go off and still maintain the audio, you'll have to have separate audio going to your speakers. This is a very niche thing, but it's something you should be aware of because I don't want you to get this and realize you have to plug it into the front. And if you're like me and it's weird, then, you know, it is what it is. So for me, it's kind of a no-go for my living room, but it's really, really good for taking on the go if I was like going to a different country and I wanted to have an editing rig with me take this in a small monitor or something like that better than a, most most of the laptops out there even though they do have some with this crazy part but it, it's got other stuff under the hood that makes up for it and then the other thing that this could be really useful for uh, is if you wanted to use a Proxmox server and just install a whole bunch of different servers because you have a lot of overhead with all that RAM and all these cores so that could be another use you could just run all kinds of different things Plus with the 2.5 gigabit ethernet, if you configure that correctly and have all the other supporting hardware, you'll have a lot of bandwidth to share between all your virtual machines that are on that unit. Now we're also gonna in the future look at some machines that are similar, but have multiple gigabit ethernet ports, which could be good if you wanted to run, you know, like a router or something like that, but it's too powerful. These, these systems are really too powerful to do a lot of that stuff. So there you know, should be a lot of waste to do it that way. Anyway, it's super fast. And like I said, the 6900HX is kind of at a nice price point right now, especially with the newer parts coming out. It's still really, really fast and it still has the, you know, USB 4 and, and DDR5 and just all the modern stuff. But you get it at a really good price. So let me know what you think of this extremely small but very capable desktop replacement from Geekom. Let me know in the comments. See you next time.